Well, hello, and welcome to our live telephone town hall meeting. We've just got a couple of folks on right now, but we are dialing out to tens of thousands of your neighbors, neighbors in Pennsylvania's 7th Congressional District. Welcome to this live forum. We have your Congresswoman Susan Wild on the line with us right now, and she's going to be joining us in just a moment to answer questions and provide updates on the issues that are affecting us in Washington, D.C. So if you have any questions in mind for Congresswoman Wild, we'll spend most of this hour-long forum taking questions from you folks in the live audience. So you can press zero at any time to submit a question for our live Q&A. We'll start out our forum by hearing some updates from Congresswoman Wild, and then as you're listening to those updates, again, be thinking about questions you'd like to ask. You might have questions about the federal stimulus relief that's proposed, uh, business closures, vaccine distribution, mental health care, any other issues on your mind. We want to take on those questions today in this live forum. Again, if you have a question in mind already that you, that you would like to submit for our Q&A with Congresswoman Wild, press zero on your phone. Speak to an operator. Let them know what your question is. And then you'll have the opportunity to ask your question live, and we'd like to give you that opportunity. Now, if you're not comfortable asking your question live, Feel free to let your operator know, I'm not comfortable asking it live, have the moderator read it for me instead, and I'm happy to do that for you. Whatever's more comfortable for you. Either way, we want you to press zero to submit questions for our live Q&A. And again, you can either go live with your question, or you can let your operator know that you'd prefer to have the moderator read it over the air instead. And we'll have Congresswoman Wild here answering those questions for the next hour. So again, zero to submit a question. Another opportunity we have for you here tonight is if you'd like to get email updates from Congresswoman Wild's office, we can provide those for you if you press 7 on your phone. 7 will take you to a different operator. They'll just take down your email address and make sure it gets added to Congresswoman Wild's email update list. And uh, that's your best way to get updates consistently on the issues that affect you in Pennsylvania's 7th Congressional District. So once more, press 7 if you'd like to give us your email address to get email updates from Representative Wild. We're just about to get started with this live forum. We've got thousands of your fellow constituents in Pennsylvania's 7th Congressional District already on the line. And a reminder, we're going to hear some updates, some quick updates from Representative Wild. When we're finished hearing from her, we're going to uh, go ahead and jump right into Q&A and spend the majority of this hour on Q&A. So I see we've already got a couple of questions in line. Uh, Jimmy Hangout, you're our first question. Thanks for submitting it. We'll be sure to get to you in just a moment. Anybody else on the line who's got a question they'd like to submit for Q&A, press zero. Speak to an operator. Let them know what your question is. And as I've mentioned, you can ask your question live in the forum, or if it's more comfortable for you, let your operator know you'd prefer to have me read your question over the air instead of bringing you live. Whatever's more comfortable for you, we're happy to take care of you tonight by uh, taking your question either live or having me read it over the air. In either case, we want to take as many questions as we have, so I'll step aside and we'll go ahead and get started with some updates from Representative Wild, then we'll jump right into Q&A. So again, zero for questions. Just press seven if you'd like to get email updates from Congresswoman Wild. And it's my pleasure to start this live virtual forum with Pennsylvania's 7th Congressional District by turning it over to your representative in Congress, Susan Wild. Go ahead, please, Representative. Thank you so much, Ian. Um, Good evening, everybody. This is Congresswoman Susan Wild, and uh, I'm really happy that you've all joined us tonight for this telephone town hall. I looked back in the calendar and realized that it was one year ago this month that we did our last in-person town hall. That one was out in New Tripoli, and um, we've done a number of telephone town halls and Facebook Lives since then, but it's mostly been specifically devoted to the topic of COVID, which, of course, has uh, been on everybody's mind for the past year. So I'm really happy to do um, this telephone town hall this evening and to have the opportunity to spend the evening with you, even if we're not able to all be together in the same place soon enough, I hope. Um, this past year has been really difficult. I don't have to tell you. I know that these past few months in particular, our country and um, sometimes our community has felt almost impossibly divided. And I want to assure you that in Washington, I intend to serve my second term in Congress being as independent-minded as ever. I'm really not interested in partisan bickering, and my focus remains squarely on the needs of the 7th District of Pennsylvania right here in our community. Um, it's been nearly a year since the coronavirus reached our shores, and I know we are all anxious to return to some level of normalcy as quickly and as safely as possible. 
And with the COVID-19 vaccine beginning to make its way through our communities, I think there is finally a light at the end of the tunnel. I know some days it seems like that light is awfully far off, um, but then other days it seems like it's getting closer and closer. And so I, I really hope that in the near future, we're going to feel much more comfortable um, in moving about, seeing others, going back into our businesses and our schools and so forth. Um, I have really been incredibly impressed by the strength and resilience of our community. And I, um, I, I want you to know that as we hopefully move toward the end of this pandemic in the coming months, we're going to do it together and we're going to come out stronger on the other side. Um, as, I, as we work to defeat the pandemic in our community and across our country, I am doing everything within my power to secure the resources we need to make it to the other side of this crisis. In December, this past December, I helped pass a $900 billion COVID-19 relief package, which first and foremost prioritized funding to states to help get the COVID-19 vaccine distributed through our community as quickly as possible. While this was a strong down payment on necessary relief, um, we know that we still need so much more. And I have to, you know, nobody knew at the beginning of this pandemic how long it was going to take, how long it was going to take to get to the end of it, and we're, we're not there yet. But we know that we have to keep meeting the need as it arises, um, and we can't stop until that need has been fully met. We need specific assistance tailored to the small businesses that power our economy. Um, I hear every day from restaurants and gyms and barber shops and salons and event centers and community centers and art venues, um, all of which rely on public gathering. We know that we need more funding for our schools. We know that we need direct aid to our state and local governments, meaning our townships our, our, and our boroughs and our cities, um, and so that they aren't forced to lay off frontline workers like bus drivers and cops and firefighters and teachers and more. And I will just continue working until this aid gets passed through Congress and signed into law by the White House. As um, our health crisis stabilizes and we move into the recovery phase, our economic security and stability is going to have to be one of our top priorities. Um, when we passed a second wave of relief at the end of 2020, we knew it was only down payment and that our communities like ours need more. Um, so the focus on rebuilding our economy is going to have to be from the middle out. And that's the way I want to see it with strong apprenticeship programs, support for small businesses, job retraining of opportunities, expanded affordable childcare options and lower costs of higher education, including vocational education. And so I'm gonna to continue to try to be as responsive as possible to all of you, to our state and local leaders, our mayors and our private sectors. Um, and I really appreciate all of you participating in tonight's call. It's uh, one of the important hallmarks of a democracy that you have the right um, as constituents to ask, ask questions, um, hard questions included of your elected officials. So I look forward being able to do that this evening. So with that, Ian, let's get to the questions. Yeah, gladly. Thank you so much, Representative, and thanks to the constituents of our 7th Congressional District for joining us. We've got some great questions already lined up. Uh, Jimmy, Mike, Maria, Chad, stay tuned. We've got you in line first. And I'll remind folks that if you want to get email updates from Congresswoman Wild's office, you can do that by pressing 7 on your phone. Right now or at any time during this forum, speak to an operator, give them your email address, and we'll be sure to keep you updated on these sorts of issues that we're discussing tonight in this forum. So seven, if you'd like to get email updates, and let's bring Jimmy in from Allentown. Hey, Jimmy, welcome to the forum. You're live with Congresswoman Wild. Go ahead with your question, please, sir. Hello, Susan. How are you doing? I'm good, Jimmy. Thank you so much for asking. Uh, first off, I would like to say congratulations on your victory in November. Um, that was Thank a, you. That was a blessing. Um, the question I had is um, first with the pandemic and the relief. When uh, when can the people of the seventh congressional district um, can start knowing that um, that relief is coming to them, whether it's the one that passed in December or the up 
upcoming one? Do you guys have a date, a specific date? Well, we are being called. I just got an update before this town hall that we are being called back um, next Monday, which was expected. And we, the first order of business, I have to tell you, um, for the last few times that we have been in session has been COVID relief. Now, that's not to say it's the only thing we work on. There are other things as well. But I fully expect that we are going to get something passed by mid-March um, at the latest and that people are going to start seeing the results of, of that um, very soon after it's passed. And just to be clear, some of the th- I, I, I know that uh, somebody will probably ask about stimulus checks, and I think that might be implied in your question, Jimmy. So I just want to um, address that before I go any further. In my view, another round of stimulus checks should have already made it to, uh, to the American people. I still hear daily from people who are struggling to make ends meet. In fact, not, not that I still hear. Uh, Every day I'm hearing from more people, people who weren't previously hurting as bad as they are hurting now, people who are having trouble putting food on the table and pay for their cars and their car insurance and afford their rent. And I think that we absolutely need to make this process smoother. We um, Unfortunately, some people still have not received their first economic impact payment. Let me just say, if you haven't, you should absolutely be calling our district office. We're going to um, give you those those phone numbers and so forth as we go along, but um, I expect that that you we should start seeing the, another round of stimulus checks um, in the middle of March. Thank you so much, Congresswoman, and uh, thank you, Jimmy. Appreciate you being part of your forum, our forum here, and uh, thanks so much for your question. We're going to go right to our next one. We've got Mike and Allentown up next. Hey, Mike, thanks for joining us. Go ahead with your question for Representative Wild. Uh, good evening. Thank you. Hi, uh, Congresswoman Wild. Thanks for um, setting this up hey, for Mike. all of us here. Hello. Um, so my, my question is really um, around trust. So so how do you restore trust in a system where many Americans feel frustrated and have a lack of trust in our government officials? And furthermore, how do you, as an elective official, how, what do you say to people who feel their voices are not heard and, and issues that have been around for many years are not getting addressed. So, so two things: um, trust, and how do we uh, how do we ensure our voices are heard with you? Well, Mike, that's a really good question um, because I think that now more than ever, people are feeling that way. And you know, there's a saying about all politics being local. Um, one of the reasons that I hold town halls like this and have regular um, hours of constituent call time, and if you anybody on this call ever wants to have one-on-one time with me to talk about an individual problem, a business problem, or otherwise, you should reach out to our office. We will get you on the schedule. Um, but in, first and foremost, I think that it's really important that elected officials listen to their constituents. I think it's the most important thing we can do. Uh, I will tell you that over the time that I have been in Congress, The information that I've gotten from people like you who have shared information with me or concerns with me has informed the work that I do in Washington. And I hope that every elected official is doing that so that even if there is a lack of trust in the overall picture, um, you know, I, I sometimes say to people, a lot of people don't like Congress, but as long as they feel like I am working for them and that I am representing them, I've done my job and at least part of my job and the other part of my job is to try to bring more of a sense of trust to Congress overall. Um, And the second part of your question, give me that one again. Just um, like the voice of the American people, how do we, I think you kind of answered it. We just make sure our voices are heard maybe through email, through scheduling appointments. You know what? Let me, let me say this. Um, I I think I speak for most people in Congress, but I can't swear to it. Um, I will tell you that we have, we spend hours and hours every week um, going through communications that we get from people right here in the community, whether it's by email, by phone, um, one-on-one conversations, as I mentioned before. Um, Don't ever think that if you send an email in, eh, it's just going to go into some kind of bin somewhere and nobody's ever going to read it and you're never going to hear back. Um, to the contrary, we, we are really, really committed to answering people's questions. 
One of the things that I'm proudest of as a member of Congress is that I'm constantly getting great feedback from people about I had a problem with this issue and I called your office and, you know, within a matter of sometimes days, sometimes weeks, the problem was solved. I get regular emails from people who tell me about longstanding problems that they've had, whether it's with a social security check or getting an SBA loan or any number of things that we have been able to help with. And by the way, it's not all done by me. I have a fabulous team both here in the Lehigh Valley as well as in Washington. And um, we are all just committed to, to answering these problems and addressing them. And I hope that elected officials everywhere have a similar type of program, but I can only speak for myself, of course. But it's a great question, Mike. But please don't ever hesitate to call us or email us. Yeah, thank you so much. Appreciate that, Representative. And thank you, Mike. And for Mike and anybody else who needs the phone number of the Lehigh County office in Allentown, that's going to be 484-781-6000. So if you do need constituent assistance, that district office phone number, again, is 484-781-6000. And we'll be sure to read that again before we get to the end of our call here. So if you didn't get a chance to write it down, grab a pen and paper. We'll go over that again in just a few minutes here. We've got uh, Maria up next from Allentown. Maria, thank you so much for uh, waiting. You're live. Go ahead, please. Yeah, hi, hi, Susan. So I appreciate your time tonight, and I hope that you're doing well and better than, uh, or a little better than you were with what, with what happened on January 6th. And so, thank you, um, Maria. My, you're you're very welcome. So I have my question is actually directly related to that, and this is really more on the the judicial branch, but I have grave concerns that what happened on that day and these people that went home and, and then even after they were arrested at the local level, these judges were just letting them go. And like supposedly one of the people was like going on a trip somewhere out of, out of the country. So I'm not sure if, if there's any kind of legislation that can be passed that can stop this kind of thing from happening. So, I mean, it's absolutely ridiculous that these people are just going home and getting away with this after the horrific uh, dystopian nightmare of what happened. So that's my first question or statement. My second one is, is related to now that there's a Democratic majority in all, all uh, the House, the Senate, and, of course, the administration, um, you know, the goal is to pass things um, that people elected, you know, President Biden for. And we do know that the, op the opposing party tends to like to steamroll and kind of bully their way through things. So um, I'm hoping that the Democratic Party will not tolerate that, um, especially because the majority of people are saying, for example, we want a $15 minimum wage for people who are working these jobs that have to work like three, four jobs just to make ends meet, or other things that, that make it more e equal for people to be able to afford to live and take care of their families. So in general, those are my two um, questions for you, and I appreciate your time tonight in responding to those. My, my pleasure, Maria. And let me just say, as somebody who was very much affected by what happened on January 6th, um, the, the need to hold people accountable, I believe, is extremely important. And it doesn't matter whether it's the commander in chief or individual perpetrators who were in the Capitol that day. Um, part of, one of the fundamental principles of our uh, judicial system has always been that we hold people accountable for their wrongdoing. And I, I completely agree with you that everyone must be held accountable that was involved and, and certainly those who were caused violence, including the death of a police officer um, and another member, uh, one of the protesters who died uh, was trampled. You know, people's lives were lost that day. And in the following days, um, we had two members of the Capitol Police who died by suicide, which is really unfathomable to me, the repercussions of that day are going to be with us for a long time. And so I don't have any control. Congress doesn't, frankly, have any control over what judges do. And, you know, this is one of the concerns about um, our judicial system and, and, and the fact that we, we quite honestly have to make sure that all the way across the country, we are electing Good judges who are who believe in um, fundamental principles of law and order without regard to party affiliation. And so I encourage everybody 
to be involved in judicial elections. Um, now at the federal level, those are appointments by the administration. I'm not referring to those, but I am referring to local level judges. Um, there's this year, you are going to have elections for judge in Lehigh County. Um, so make sure you know who's on the ballot and make sure that you, you, you know what they stand for. Um, as far as the second part of your question, let me just say that I believe, I, I understand what you're saying about um, the, the divide, let's say, between Republicans and Democrats these days. And I also recognize that Joe Biden was elected by, uh, you know, a, a majority of the electors in this country, as well as by a strong majority of individual voters. Having said that, um, there, it is still incredibly important to me, and I believe it's incredibly important to President Biden that that voices from the other side be listened to and that they be heard, um, treated respectfully for the most part, assuming that they are treating us with respect. Um, I do believe in Congress that we don't really make progress without bipartisanship. I have been spending an awful lot of time over the last few months talking to my predecessor, Charlie Dent, who, of course, was a Republican, um, someone with whom I don't necessarily agree or didn't agree with some of his, a lot of his votes, quite honestly. Um, uh, but he and I have a respect and a trust, and he's done everything he can to help me be a success in this office. Um, and I, I, I think that's really important because I think he recognizes that it's not about the person, it's about the job that's being done for the people of Pennsylvania 7. So having said that, it's going to continue to be my goal to try to work across the aisle. Will it always work? No. Will there be some people that I simply find it impossible to work with because of their positions? Absolutely. But what I have found in the two plus years that I have been in Congress is that I can find something in common with most of the people across the aisle. We've worked on we've worked on a bipartisan task force to to combat opioid addiction. That more than just about anything I can think of is something where there is a lot of bipartisan consensus. Um, same thing when it comes to issues like veterans uh, care and uh, the the uh, kinds of benefits that veterans get, as well as our armed services. I'm happy that I, before COVID hit, I was able during Christmas week of 2019 to go on a bipartisan trip to the Middle East over Christmas week where we visited the troops in the Middle East. And, um, you know, we can, it's that kind of coming together and, and spending time with each other and understanding where our commonalities are um, more than our differences that I think is incredibly important. So having said all of that, yes, I do believe that President Biden was elected because of a mandate by a majority of the American people about certain things that have to get done. I hope to assist this administration in accomplishing those goals. But at the same time, I'm not leaving bipartisanship or compromise at the curbside. Thank you very much, Representative. Very much appreciate that answer. And Maria, thank you so much for your question and for being a part of our forum today. We're moving right along to Chad in Whitehall next. Hey, Chad, thanks for waiting. You're live on the line with Representative Wild. Hi, Susan. I'm a postal worker at the Lehigh Valley facility in Bethlehem. Uh, yourself and Senator Casey came out about six months ago to meet myself and the local president, Andy Kubat. Um, my concern I is remember. that... <laughs> my con Yeah, we weren't allowed in, remember? <laughs> um my concern is that Postmaster Den General DeJoy rolled out a plan, I believe it was on Friday. He wants to slow the mail down even more to three- to five-day delivery, which I believe will crush the Postal Service and could have a huge impact on the economy. Um, so I know you guys have a million things going on, but I just wanted to remind um, yourself, and I will reach out to Senator Casey tomorrow. I was going to call you today, but since you called me, we can take care of it. Um, just to kind of hope that the Postal Service doesn't fall under the back burner um, while other things are being taken care of. 
I don't think you should worry one bit, Chad, that the Postal Service is going to the back burner. Um, first of all, as I'm fond of saying, there are a whole lot of us in Congress. Some people would say too many of us. But the good news is that that enables us to work along parallel tracks. So while one team of people may be working um, on trade issues and tariffs and that kind of thing, Another whole group of people is working on postal service issues, while some of the rest of us are working on education issues. So we are, and also most of us are blessed with the, the skill of multitasking. And again, most of that's because we have really wonderful teams that back us up. Um, President Biden isn't going to let the postal service be a back burner issue, believe me. I, I have, it's probably after, a, after COVID questions, and there are a lot of different COVID questions. The Postal Service is probably one of the top things that we hear about. People are very frustrated. People are still receiving their Christmas cards through no fault, by the way, Chad, of the letter carriers or the postal workers, but, you know, mostly because of changes that were made in the system. Although, to some extent, I will say that some, the, the workforce, as I understand it, in the Postal Service has been um, decreased because of COVID in in a in addition to other things, people who have been out because of COVID and that kind of thing. Um, I joined a member letter to President, meaning members of Congress, to, jo to President Biden just last week, asking him to fill vacancies that are on the USPS Board of Governors as quickly as possible. Um, the mail delays that have been ongoing for months across the country are completely unacceptable, and there has to be more congressional oversight of the agency. Congress is has been given the right and obligation, the duty and obligation of oversight of various agencies. And we absolutely need to make sure that the Postal Service is one that we are able to oversee very quickly. One of the things I just want to mention, and then we'll move on to the next question, is that one of the difficulties we had, quite frankly, in the last two years of the Trump administration is that when we tried to conduct oversight hearings, of different agencies, we often would either have subpoenas ignored, um, witnesses that just didn't show, or witnesses that showed up and really didn't give us any kind of answers. So I am looking forward to a more transparent administration, one that will um, acknowledge where the problems are and will work with us to try to correct them. And But believe me, Chad, this is no back burner issue. Thank you, Congresswoman, and thank you, Chad. Really appreciate you being on. Thanks for the work that you and your fellow postal workers do. Thanks so much. We've got Linda right away next in Strasburg. Hey, Linda, you're live. Go ahead. Hi, Congresswoman Wild. How are you? I'm good, Linda. Good up here in Strasburg, except we have big problems with getting a vaccine. And I don't know if this is really part of the federal government's issue or if this is a state problem, but I just don't understand why here in Pennsylvania, that you have to chase down a vaccine appointment. You can be on like I am, pre-registered in our two hospitals up here and patiently wait for them to call you, which is fine with me. And I'm personally not one that's chasing a vaccine, but if you are, you have to, for example, go on the White Markets website and go through the whole procedure, whether to see whether you are, you know, you're eligible and then you have to click on the store and they tell you it's not available. And then you click on another store they tell you it's not available. Then you try Rite Aid, and it's the same thing. I don't understand why we can't have a, I, I call it an umbrella system. I don't know if that's the correct term. But why can't there just be one place where you can sign up, and when an appointment becomes available within 25 miles, if you would put that in of your zip code, for example, appointments are now available. Sign up. Why do you have to do this? I don't, I don't get it. And from what I understand from talking to people at the state level, the state's just refusing to do it. And the response that I got is there's too many providers. It's too hard. Well, Linda, um, that, right now, that is the number one question I get is about vaccine availability and why it's so darn hard. Um, let me just say this. I think what you're referring to when you called it an, an umbrella system, ideally we would have had some sort of federal system that would have then, you know, fed down into each of the 50 states um, and we would have had some sort of concerted plan for vaccines. We didn't, quite, quite frankly, the initial response to the COVID um, emergency was inadequate. 
Um, this administration, meaning the Biden administration, essentially inherited what is already a broken system. And so what we've got is a lot of catch up that is going on. I do believe that it's starting to get just a little bit easier. I, we have received assurances of um, and a further increase in vaccine supply to every state from the Biden administration that just came down. And the more vaccines that are made available, the more that we're going to be getting them and the more that people are going to be able to have um, get them in their arms. The problem is the distribution system. I will tell you that back in October, I led a letter to then Vice President Pence um, and a number of my colleagues signed on to it. And we were specifically asking about what the vaccine distribution system was going to be like, what plan had been made to roll it out. Because at that point, if you remember, we didn't have a vaccine, but we knew one was coming or more than one. And we wanted to make sure that there was a system to roll it out. Uh, we received some assurances, which have turned out not to have actually been put into place. And so we've got states that are operating a patchwork system. I am the first to say it's inadequate. I'm the first to say it's highly frustrating, especially if you're one of those people who really, really needs the vaccine as soon as possible. And there are an awful lot of people in that category. And so what we have to do at this point, because we're dealing with a patchwork, is we every state is a little bit different, although pretty much every state is, it, with a couple of exceptions, almost every state is reporting problems with a very awkward, awkward is a bad word, it's not even a strong enough word, uh, a very cumbersome rollout of the vaccine distribution plan. Even within one area, we're seeing different hospitals um, have different availability of the vaccines. We're really fortunate here in Pennsylvania 7 to have a couple of really fine hospital networks, and I don't put any of this on them. Um, I put this on a combination of state and federal ineptness, and all I can tell you is we're working really hard to, to and pushing as hard as we can to make sure, and I, I don't think we have to push the Biden administration to understand how critical this is, um, but we just can't let up for one second until it's it's smoothed out. And it's uh, unfortunately just not been handled particularly well. Thank you very much. Really appreciate that answer. And uh, another great question. Thank you to Linda. We've had so many great questions tonight. And I'll go ahead and make a reminder here that if you'd like to get email updates from Congresswoman Wild's office moving forward on the issues that affect you in Washington, D.C., press 7 on your phone. Speak to an operator, give them your email address. We'll keep you updated via email moving forward. So, again, that's seven if you'd like to get email updates. Suzanne, uh, thank you for joining us. You're live on the line with Representative Wild. Hi. Yes, Representative Wild. Thank you so much for having this town hall. A um, couple questions, actually. One, I had one initial question, but then based on other callers, I have two uh, questions uh, in addition to that. My main question was, and I know this isn't federal, this is more of a state question, um, but one of the biggest frustrations that I hear um, from a lot of people in, in, in this area is the fact that Governor Wolf is not giving us any hope or any indication as to what the status is for our state, for getting people back to work, for getting our kids back to school. Um, at least back in May, there was a plan. Now there seems to be nothing. So we have nothing to look forward to. Like, do we think that something, you know, is, is when we hit a certain number over a certain, you know, I don't know if you have any insight to that, but I would assume that, um, uh, you know, that our representatives do um, meet and speak with the governor. Um, and, you know, I've been emailing people left and right to try to get some sort of update um, on where we stand. What's the plan? But we haven't gotten a plan since May. Um, you know, I'll be honest with you, uh, Suzanne, I I have some of the same frustration. I actually was, and you're right, members of Congress do speak with the governor on a regular basis. We just had a call with him, uh, I'd say 10 days ago, in which the governor um, essentially said uh, the state hasn't done a good enough job. Um, and, and that was a lot of that conversation focused on vaccines. But I think there are other areas that um, really warrant um, 
immediate attention within Pennsylvania. Um, first of all, let me just say, and this is not an excuse by any means, but we've all heard the word unprecedented far too many times. And, and I don't think anybody anticipated that we were going to have a pandemic of this scale um, back when it first started. Um, and so it's, but, but having said that, anticipated or not, we don't always, we're not always able to anticipate natural disasters and that kind of thing. And, and yet we have to deal with them. Um, so that is the function of government. And we, and I don't believe that a good enough job has been done. Um, we, one of the, my frustrations, I will tell you, is that at the federal level, when we are appropriating money to be passed down to the states to be used for specific purposes, whether it's for schools, whether it's for vaccines, um, or whatever else, we expect it to be spent in the manner in which it was appropriated. And many of you know that, and this is something that I objected to very, very loudly, that um, a substantial amount of money that was appropriated for Pennsylvania that should have come down to individuals and to businesses um, actually was used by the state legislature and the governor together to balance the budget of Pennsylvania. Um, now, some of the expenses that they covered by doing that needed to be covered. But having said that, that wasn't the purpose for which we in Congress had appropriated the money. And so I was furious personally. I expressed my views um, to those who would listen in the state government. And um, I, one of the things that we learned from that experience is to tighten up the laws as, as we pass them when we appropriate money. That we, and one of the problems, by the way, that was not originally intended. Um, the CARES Act money was not intended for states to be able to use to balance their budgets. Um, but the Treasury Secretary at the time made a change to the regulations, which we hadn't anticipated, and that's what allowed them to do it. So we are tightening up language. We are making sure that money that we appropriate goes to the purpose for which it was intended. Um, one of the things that, you know, uh, that I was really proud of last year, it seems like forever ago, um, but we were, I was able to deliver nine point, almost $10 million to the Allentown School District out of the CARES Act. Um, and that was money that was specifically allocated to school districts to help them at the beginning of this pandemic when, when school districts were struggling with, you know, especially underserved school districts were struggling with issues like how are we going to get computer hardware to these kids? How are we going to get them hotspots so they can participate in virtual learning? Um, so when we were able to do that, and it helped. I mean, I will tell you the school superintendent told me he was doing backflips when he heard that they were getting that allocation. But we've got to make sure that when money is appropriated, that it's going to exactly what we intended to have it spent on. That was your first question. You said you had another one. Yeah, I just have, I have two other quick ones. Um, and speaking of school districts, as a school teacher uh, of a special needs student, as a matter of fact, um, what steps are you taking, if any, to forward teachers becoming, um, uh, what's the word, uh, essential, listed as essential personnel? Well, if you mean for vaccination because I would think what... taking care of our children is essential. Well, there's no question about it. And I have said since the beginning that they should have been considered essential workers and put in the first tranche of vaccine um, recipients. Uh, unfortunately, that was a state issue um, and it was did not happen. There's teachers in other states that were put into that category and they've been doing much better in terms of getting their kids back to school. So first and foremost, um, I think that that should have been done. I'm dismayed that it's still not done. I believe teachers are in the 1B category, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and it's, you know, I, I agree with you. Everybody that I talk to wants to know, when are we going to reopen our schools? When, when are my kids going to go back to school? And, you know, my answer is when, when we feel, when everybody feels that it's safe to, to send our kids back to school, to put our teachers in the schools um, and, you know, to, to make sure that they, we can, the kids can participate in learning without taking home um, a virus to, to vulnerable family members and same thing for teachers and staff and custodians and, you know, the cafeteria ladies and everybody else. Um, 
but the only way we do that is by getting these vaccinations rolling quickly. And I agree that teachers should be in that top tier category. Thank you very much, Representative. And uh, Suzanne, I'm afraid we're, we're gonna have to limit you to just two questions. We've got a lot of folks waiting to ask questions. So thank you for the two that you did ask and for your participation in our live forum today. And thank you, Representative, for the answers. We're gonna go to our next question live from Jeremy and Easton. Jeremy, thanks for waiting. You're live, go ahead, sir. As we know, Pennsylvania and jobs have been devastated by the pandemic, and we were already going to hit with economic downturn before that. What ways do you think we can help rebuild our economy? And one way I, is do you support uh, green jobs and trying to get green job legislation in upcoming stimulus bills to help rebuild the economy and uh, help us uh, you know, help our environment and help our country. Um, I, I'm having a little bit of, your voice is breaking up a little bit, but I think that I got the drift of the question, which I'm just going to kind of repeat for anybody that couldn't hear it. Um, Jeremy expressed concerns about the downturn in the economy and, and loss of jobs and asked whether I was going to support green jobs um, and to help both our environment and our joblessness. The answer to that is absolutely. I think the single best thing that we could do um, to, to rebuild our economy and fairly quickly would be for members of Congress to come together, by that I mean both sides of the aisle, and pass a massive infrastructure package, which would include um, green jobs, renewable energy jobs. We are still working with an infrastructure that was built back in the 1950s, long before we had the kind of technologies that we have now, including green technologies. And so I think an infrastructure package would go a long way, not only towards putting people back to work, but to rebuilding our economy in a way that is much more environmentally friendly. The other way, Jeremy, that I think is really important in terms of getting the, getting the jobless numbers um, cut is to, to move forward with apprenticeships. I'm a big supporter of apprentice, apprenticeships. Um, we have passed a bill that has to do with the National Apprenticeship Act. Um, I am hopeful that it will pass the Senate and will be signed into law, but it specifically provides incentives to employers to provide incentives so that people can earn while they learn without incurring huge amounts of student loan debt. And I think that is incredibly important. Apprenticeships have worked very, very well in other countries. They've worked very well in some sectors of our economy, but we've got to, imp we've got to bring them into other sectors as well. Thank you very much, Jeremy. Great question. Thanks for being in our forum. Thank you again, Representative. We're going to go to Carolyn next. Karen in Schnecksville is up and live. Hey, Carolyn, uh, you're live with Representative Wild. Go ahead. Hi, thanks very much for this town hall and giving me the opportunity to speak with you. Um, actually, the question that I had um, has primarily been answered with regard to the rollout and distribution of the COVID vaccine, um, but I'd like to take it one step further. I mean, I realize that unfortunately the timing of all of this with the change of administrations did not allow for a good plan to be in place but just thinking uh, for the future, I mean, this um, is not going away. We're going to need to be revaccinated. And my concern is with regard to populations that have really been discriminated against in terms of this rollout. Um, the elderly, individuals with disabilities, um, individuals that live in poverty that don't have access to internet and computers, and they have truly been, it has broken my heart to see the number of individuals that truly are in need of this vaccine and to then, you know, know that, um, I realize everyone needs to get it, but there needs to be some type of better system to prioritize those that are getting it because individuals that work for a hospital who are young, in good health, work remotely from home in IT jobs should not be getting this vaccine before, you know, an individual with a disability or um, a senior citizen. Um, you know, I, I work both in education and I have a second job um, working as a support staff for 
an individual with a disability, and so that qualified me uh, to get the vaccine. Um, I've gotten my first dose. I also have two children with disabilities, and thankfully, with a lot of perseverance, was able to get them appointments. But what it has taken, and, and, and I know you recognize this, so basically my question is, what can be done in advance of the next round, next season, uh, when these immunizations will be occurring again to ensure that the people who truly need it will be the ones that will be first in line to get it? So we've learned a lot, Carolyn, from our experience this time around. Um, we've learned a lot about what has been done wrong, um, what can be made better. And I truly believe that when we're in our second wave of immunizations against COVID, assuming that that's what's determined to be necessary and all indications are that we will need to do it at least annually, um, that we will have a better system in place. But let me just I want to give a, a bit of a shout out to our hospital network. They have mobile vaccine vans that are up and ready to start going to the communities that you're talking about. The problem has been the vaccine supply. Um, you're absolutely right. If somebody doesn't have a proper broadband in their house, they don't have proper internet or internet at all, there's no way they're going to be able to keep, keep hitting refresh on their computer page until they actually find a, a slot um, open for a vaccine. Um, same thing with the elderly, same thing with vulnerable populations that are underserved rural communities. Um, so it's this is an area where I truly believe there needs to be a public-private partnership. And I do think, I, let me just say, here in Pennsylvania 7, I think that we have done as good a job as anywhere in terms of that public-private par partnership. We see the um, what used to be the Sands Casino, now Wind Creek, um, as a location where the vaccines were being done just today. We see private, um, private outfits that are offering up their space um, at no charge to make sure that people can come in and be vaccinated. And at the same time, we're seeing the hospitals work with these, these private entities. We're seeing pharmacies. And I, I see people volunteering all the time. They don't always get accepted to, to do it, but people who are qualified to dispense um, the the um, injections. So uh, I do believe that we have learned some really valuable lessons as a result of this pandemic. Now, that doesn't really go a long way with people like, oh, great, we've learned some lessons. But um, whenever we can learn something really important in the field of public health, I think it's, it's critical. I mean, public health issues are never going to go away. And if it's not a COVID-19 pandemic, there's going to be something else at some point. And so the lessons that we've learned as a result of this have been really, I think, valuable for the future. I, persist, I have, I, I, I started this program of doing a Friday morning working group call with sectors across the Lehigh Valley, senior citizen sector, um, the health networks, education and leading people in each of those sectors are on this weekly call. I think we just had our 44th weekly call and we do it every single Friday, which I guess gives you an idea of just how long we've been in this pandemic. Um, but we share information, we share where things have gone wrong and where things have gone right. That kind of sharing of information between um, government and a uh, private sector I think is critical, and it's the only way that we learn from our mistakes and do better in the future, and, and hopefully that we're, we're getting a lot of out of this that we will implement in the future. But I, I'm with you, Carolyn. I think you're absolutely right. Thank you so much, Representative. And thank you, Carolyn. Great question. Appreciate you taking that conversation further for us. And a quick reminder here, folks, you can press 7 if you'd like to give us your email address for email updates. Uh, this is our last call for emails. You can always sign up on the Congresswoman's website if that's your preference, but if you'd like to just get a quick, easy way to sign up for email updates from your representative, go ahead and press 7 on your phone right now, and uh, we'll go ahead and make sure to get you on that email update list. And in just a couple of minutes here before we get to the end, I'll also read the contact information for the representative's uh, district office as well, if you didn't get a chance to write that down earlier. Let's go ahead and go to Santos and Allentown next. Hey, Santos, thanks for joining us. Go to your question, please. 
Hi, good evening. Yes, my name is Santos. Uh, good evening, Susan. Uh, my question is about health care. Uh, my health care uh, is so expensive. You know, uh, I pay almost $600 a week, family plan, and the cost of, of medication is so expensive. And I don't know it's a lot of going on in Washington, but my concern is, uh, you know, if I keep uh, the health care keep going up and up, how I'm going to be able to afford it? I'm going to pay almost half of my check and only a health care, and how you can fix it. Well, Santos, I'm glad you asked that question um, because it highlights one of the areas that I was working on um, very, very hard before the pandemic ever struck. And this pandemic has only emphasized the importance of getting our health, of fixing our health care system, which quite candidly um, is in need of a lot of fixing. Um, first of all, we I be- strongly believe that we have to protect the ACA, the Affordable Care Act. But you bring up a point, Santos, about the cost of it. And so, you know, it's wonderful to have um, the Affordable Care Act, but we still are hearing from far too many people who are paying too much in premiums or, uh, conversely, they they pay lower premiums, but they have a very, very high deductible, and as a result, they just never bother using it because it's, you know, they're essentially paying for nothing because they're they're not going to go to the doctor's office when they've got a ten thousand dollar deductible or something like that. So this is something that I've been working on since I got to Congress. It's the main reason I wanted to go to Congress, um, and we we have, I will tell you, passed um, the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Enhancement Act. It is a stabilization package for the ACA which will lower health insurance um, premiums and the cost of prescription drugs. Prescription drugs are as big a problem as the health insurance premiums, quite honestly. Um, I talk to people uh, on a very regular basis who don't take their medications on a regular basis or cut them in half or skip doses or can't, you know, go to the pharmacy and they're, they're, they think they're going to pick up their medication and then they find out the price and they, they turn it away. Um, I really believe that massive prescription drug price overhauls need to happen. Last uh, term in Congress, we passed HR3, which was a landmark uh, prescription drug program. It was not taken up by the Senate under Mitch McConnell. It's going to be reintroduced and it absolutely would call for, uh, absolutely would provide for lower prescription drug prices. And I've also led um, efforts for price caps um, on prescription drugs that treat medical conditions that are most adversely affected by the coronavirus, like medications for heart disease, insulin for diabetes, inhalers for asthma. Um, but that's, that is an effort just designed to last during this pandemic. What we really need to do is to pass HR3, which would end the ban on Medicare negotiating directly with the drug companies and would uh, create powerful new tools um, to force drug companies to agree to real price uh, reduction and also making sure that seniors never lose access to prescriptions that they need. So um, it's, you know, this once... Uh, you know, as I said before, we're multitaskers in Congress, but so much focus has gone into COVID of late, um, including, of course, the health emergency caused by COVID, that um, we haven't spent as much time working on an overhaul of our health, um, uh, of health generally in this country. We've got to get back to that. Um, we've, in the past, faced very stiff opposition from the other side of the aisle. It is going to require, because we, you know, Democrats have a very narrow uh, margin in the House of Representatives, it's going to require bipartisan cooperation in order to get the kinds of changes that we need to health care in America. So um, I, I hope that we're able to do it. I don't, you know, I, I ran on a platform of wanting to get uh, more health care to more people um, at a more affordable price quality health care, um, and, and I, I continue to be absolutely dedicated to that. We've got some of the finest health care networks um, in the country right here in the Lehigh Valley, but if, if you can't afford to use them, then what good are they to you? 
So my heart goes out to people who can't afford um, the medical care that they need or the prescription drugs they need. And I, I truly, um, it, it is one of my top priorities. Thank you, Representative. Thank you, Santos. Appreciate you being in our forum. Thanks so much for your question. And we're going to go right to our next question. We've got uh, about five minutes left in our forum. We're going to take as many questions as we can here. And we've got Jerome uh, in Allentown. Go ahead, Jerome. Hello. I, I have a question bouncing off of Santos's question. Wouldn't it just be better to go to the pharmaceutical companies and force them to lower prices instead of constantly tweaking Medicare? And my other question is about I just want to hear more about the apprenticeship program I, I'm in trade school right now sure um, well we we don't have that ability to just force prescription uh, pharma to, to lower prices um, we because remember we do have a very strong motivation to make sure that pharmaceutical companies are continuing the kind of research and development that is needed to, to um, manufacture life-saving drugs for many diseases however having said that um, we do know that pharmaceutical companies actually spend more money on marketing and advertising than they do on research and development, which is something I learned after I got to Congress and was appalled by. So um, I think that what, if we make um, – if Medicare can start negotiating drug prices with pharmaceutical companies, which, by the way, the Veterans Administration can, but for some reason Medicare cannot, and – Somebody in their infinite wisdom many years ago devised that. Um, the the bill's HR3, the one that I referred to, would make the lower drug prices that are negotiated by Medicare available to all Americans, including those with private insurance, not just Medicare beneficiaries. So why the emphasis on Medicare? Because me Medicare recipients are the single largest consumer of prescription drugs. So they are the market for most pharmaceutical companies. That's why it's so vitally important to make sure that Medicare can negotiate drug prices, which then would be made available to all Americans. By the way, um, HR3 also would create a $2,000 out-of-pocket limit on prescription drug costs, um, an annual out-of-pocket limit, which may sound high to some of us who don't have very expensive medications, but for those people who do have really expensive medications and are often spending more than that every month, that would be a real lifesaver. Thank you, Representative, and thank you again to Jerome. Thanks for being a part of our forum today. Um, we're going to go to uh, another question in just a moment here, but one last reminder. Uh, we just cleared that queue of folks who were giving us their email address for updates. If you want to give us your email address for updates, press 7 before we get to the end of our call here. Speak to an operator. Give them your email. Tara in Germansville, thank you for waiting. You are live on the line with Representative Wild. Go ahead. Hi, Susan Wild. How are you? I'm good. Um, my question for you is, with the COVID pandemic and a lot of people losing their job and um, unable to pay rent, or in some cases their mortgage, there has been moratoriums that have been put on evictions. Um, so you can't evict somebody who is renting and can't make their rent, um, which it's a snowball effect because it also affects landlords, especially if they're smaller landlords and not a bigger um, conglomerate that owns a lot of property. Um, but my question is, beyond the initial moratoriums, is there talk about what to do? Because eventually when the moratoriums end, all that back rent is going to be owed to landlords. So right. now these people are just kind of getting further and further in debt. And it's almost like we're kicking the can down the road for them. Is there mm -hmm. some sort of talk or plans in place in the future on how to get to, to get between the landlords and the tenants or the mortgage companies and those people who are behind caught up without them being thrown out of their home or, you know, uh, either the people who are holding the mortgage or the people who are holding the buildings being, <clears throat> I mean, eating that, that money that's not being paid. Well, you're absolutely right. I recognized early on that, and maybe it's because of the nature of our district where we have a lot of smaller landlords. Um, small landlords, by and large, are landlords as a business, and they've got fixed expenses, they've got mortgages to pay, they have maintenance expenses, all kinds of things. So while I do support continuing the eviction moratorium, I have to believe that, or I, ha I believe that we must make sure that landlords can 
can pay their bills too. Um, they're often, and many of them are struggling as a result of this pandemic because of tenants not being able to pay their, their rent. The current stimulus bill that's moving through Congress right now, you've all probably heard the term reconciliation, which is the process we're going through right now. Um, the reconciliation bill has $25 billion in it for rent relief, which doesn't mean um, rent forgiveness. It means rent relief, direct payments of rent monies, which will help landlords as it will help keep uh, rent coming to them. And it also has, by the way, $10 billion for struggling homeowners. But I think that we've learned that just, um, you know, forgiving people's rent or, or delaying their rent is, is no solution at all. You're absolutely right. I've, many people are very worried about this um, big bill that's going to come at them when the moratorium's end. So I think the more, um, the, the more direct way of doing it and the more helpful way of doing it is to provide rent relief that then gets used specifically for paying people's rent. Thank you, Representative. And thank you again, Tara. Appreciate you being on our forum with us today. And uh, Representative, we are at the end of our hour. So I've got some closing comments that will include your website and your um, Lehigh County, Allentown District Office. But if you've got any closing thoughts for your constituents before we wrap up here, please do go ahead. Um, I, you know, that an hour goes way too fast. Um, I, I was, I would love to do this again soon, and we will, we will absolutely try to do it. I, I just wanted you all to know that, um, first of all, I really appreciate your participating. I do believe that it is a fundamental aspect of our democracy that you should be able to ask elected officials questions and get their answers to them. Um, that's number one. Number two, it really does help uh, educate us about what kinds of concerns people in our districts have. So I would ask um, that you please reach out to our office whenever you have something that we might be able to help you with. Our district office, Ian, I believe, is going to give you the information. Um, we have a D.C. office. We have the office in Allentown. We have an office in Easton and an office in Stroudsburg. Um, and an amazing team that can help people with all kinds of problems, whether it's you didn't receive your economic impact payment or if you, uh, or to, to any other kind of problem. And if you ask us a question that we can't help you with, but we know of some other government agency or some other elected official, perhaps at the state level, we will make sure you get in touch with that person so that your question doesn't just, it's, it's not going to be just a, sorry, we can't help you with that particular question. So please, please reach out for, to our offices um, for assistance. And thank you so much for participating in this. Thank you again, Representative Wild. We really appreciate you being with us today. And thank you to uh, the constituents of the 7th Congressional District. We appreciate you joining us as well. If you need more information on the Congresswoman, and including any uh, contact information, email addresses, phone numbers, uh, and additional information, you can find that online at wild.house.gov. That's wild.house.gov online, and you can find all of the three different district offices, the D.C. office, and contact information. But that Lehigh County Allentown uh, phone number, I'll go ahead and read that for you one more time. If you do need constituent assistance, you can call that number, and it's going to be 484-781-6000. Again, that Allentown office is 484 781 6,000. And we're actually, if we didn't get your question answered here at the end of our forum, we're going to wrap up now and send folks a voicemail. So if you have additional questions or concerns or something you need assistance with from Congresswoman Wild's office, stay on the line here. Leave a voicemail message and make sure you leave your name and your contact information in addition to your question or concern or whatever else you need to help with. Again, you can stay on the line to leave those voicemail messages now. And if you do need assistance, be sure to leave your contact information and your name in addition to your question or concern. I'd like to thank everybody for joining us this evening. We really do appreciate your questions. That's what drives these forums and what made this forum so, uh, so special and so successful. So thanks to all of you who submitted questions and to those of you who listened in. We appreciate you. Thanks to Representative Wild for answering the questions. We'll go ahead and wrap up here. Have a great night, everybody, and stay safe.